why don't we get started We're right at 11 through three after our start time, three minutes after our start time. So let's get into it. Um, welcome everybody. Um, thank you all for taking part in the eighth annual Delaware River Watershed Forum. We are going into our second day today and it's been immensely successful so far. Lots of wonderful information being shared, um, all sorts of different organizations involved. Um, and you know, we're really excited to bring you today's presentation on civic engagement strategies for watershed conservation. Um, I have a little bit of housekeeping stuff that I wanna go over first. Um, so firstly, I am your host. My name is Rita Yelda. I am the Outreach and Communications Manager for the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed. Um, if you have any kind of technical questions or anything like that during the presentation, feel free to open up your chat box um, and let me know. Um, send me a message in there. You can send me a private message. You can also, during the presentation, type your questions in for the presenters into the chat box. We're going to do a Q&A right at the end. Um, so make sure that, you know, if you have a question that pops up, type it right in the chat box as it does, and then we will address that at the end. Um, let me go to my next slide here. So this session is being recorded um, and it will be shared um, with all of the attendees afterwards. You will all be muted by me. Um, <laughs> if you haven't been already, then I will mute you all very shortly. Um, just to kind of get the background noise and stuff like that out. Um, you can either raise your hand, there's a little raise your hand button option in Zoom, um, or you can, like I said, um, type in a question into the chat box if you're having a technical issue or if you wanted to say something to one of the presenters today. Um, and if you haven't already signed up for Sketch, um, please go do so. It's very cool. You can see our speaker bios in there. Um, you can make your schedule for the four days of the forum. And um, that's also where all of the different links are for the sessions. Let me see. So I want to, with that, I want to introduce our presenters today. Um, we're going to be hearing from three different folks. First is Colleen Walters. She is the Delaware River Basin Program Manager for River Network. Um, then we are going to hear from Diana Martin, who is the Director of Communications and Marketing for the Rodale Institute. And then we're going to hear from Eric Eckel, who is the owner of Water Words That Work. Um, and they all have some really wonderful examples of civic engagement and getting communities involved. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Colleen. Great. Thank you, Rita. I appreciate the introduction. I'm really excited to be part of this panel on civic engagement, and I'm looking forward to connecting with all of you throughout the forum. Um, and first, I just wanted to introduce River Network for those of you who might not be familiar. Uh, we work to connect water focused on profits, agencies, business, and communities for greater local impact and healthier rivers across the U.S. For more information on what we do and how to become involved in our network, you can go to our website, it's rivernetwork.org. Um, and so today I am going to be discussing civic engagement from the regulatory perspective under the Clean Water Act. So specifically talking about engagement in open comment periods. Um, this is a very underutilized, but a very, very important piece of the implementation of the Clean Water Act. So I really want to highlight it today and show you some specific ways to get involved and to let your voice be heard. Next slide, please. So to just better frame this presentation, I wanted to uh, just quickly go through the Clean Water Act goals and the frameworks that allow for public input. Um, so the objective, we're aiming to restore and maintain chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our nation's waters. Our national goal, to eliminate um, discharge of pollutants and to attain fishable, swimmable waters. Um, and then so uh, locally, we have water quality standards. They are specific goals for a particular water body or segment, and the EPA required that states and authorized tribes establish these water quality standards for each of their water bodies. Um, the standards consist of designated uses and then establishing water quality criteria to protect those uses. Um, and then there's also anti-degradation policies that go along with that to be, um, to ensure protections and to uh, ensure that clean waters stay clean. 
Next slide, please. So those are the goals, uh, the national goals, and then those are the local goals with um, water quality standards. Um, so each state has water quality standards. Now, how do we assess progress against those goals, against those water quality standards? Um, so one way is through the triennial review process. Every three years, states and authorized tribes are required to review and revise as necessary their water quality standards. And with this is an open public comment period that will allow you to comment on your standards of your state. So here you can assess the accuracy of the standards and compare them with what you're seeing on the ground. So for instance, if you've observed and documented existing uses taking place in a particular segment, but they aren't actually covered under the established and protected designated uses, that's one way to let your state know um, that through the, the public comment process. Next slide, please. And so another way that um, we assess progress under the Clean Water Act is through integrated reports. Um, this report is completed every two years and consists of a um, list of impaired waters and those waters that require uh, a TMDL, a total maximum daily load, as well as an assessment of the segments and pollution control plans. Um, you can be engaged um, through this process on the front end by submitting your data to your state to help inform these impairment lists and inform priorities. Uh, these, uh, um, uh, the, the data submissions typically have tiers, the states typically have tiers of acceptance for what the state can use in the report. So you'll wanna check with your state before um, compiling the data and before submitting it. But that's one way to, um, to get involved on the front end in this process. And once the report is drafted, there's also an opportunity for public comment. Um, so uh, you can um, review the report and you can comment on uh, things like specific um, stream segments, um, review um, specific. specific. I, is there something wrong with my audio? I just got a blip. Oh, I think we're okay. Okay. Um, so reviewing specific stream segments in this report and comparing it to what you're seeing, what data you've collected, and then commenting, um, you know, if you see any discrepancies or things like that. Uh, next slide, please. So permits will also have opportunities for public comment. Um, they can be new permits or they can be renewals of existing permits. Um, so they are cyclical. Um, they're not every three years or every two years like the integrated report or uh, trial no review. They kind of come in waves depending on when the actual permit started. Um, so for example, the NIPTES permits, they are every five years on a five-year cycle. So if you're curious what permits are active in your area and you want to um, you know, figure out what's going on in your area as far as permitting, you can look them up on your state's website and you can find out when they expire and, and kind of uh, uh, make a mental note of when to look out for renewals to, uh, to comment. Um, TMDLs, uh, they will be released for comment as your state completes them. Uh, the list of TMDLs, um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, will be included in the integrated report. So you can check and see if your area either already has an, a TMDL or there's one in the works or one to be developed. Um, and I should note that these opportunities typically don't receive much input from the public. And so a comment could potentially go a long way in, um, and open up the lines of communication with your state agency. You know, we've recently supported several local groups in submitting comments and letters of support for TMDL in Pennsylvania and the DEP staff person who, um, who writes the TMDLs expressed how excited and inspired he was at the amount of attention and support the TMDL was getting because typically he doesn't really see much. So um, this type of engagement can potentially lead to, you know, enhance, enhanced communication and watershed collaborations. Uh, next slide, please. So now I have a poll, um, Rita, if you could launch it. So I'm curious if you have ever submitted a public comment for one of these processes for um, a triennial review or an integrated report or, um, or permitting any of the permits. Um, and then if your answer is no, um, why not? Or if, if your answer is, you know, maybe you've submitted one or two, but, um, but haven't, uh, but, but have been discouraged um, in the past for, um, 
for submitting them? Um, and was it because there wasn't um, enough opportunity? Maybe you were intimidated by the process, didn't feel like you were the right person to be submitting these comments, um, reviewing the document was confusing, or if there's something else, um, I'd love for you to uh, put it in the chat box. All right, so I'm seeing a lot of no's, <laughs> which um, is, is not surprising. And I think, um, you know, as you guys, have, as you have said, I mean, I don't know if you're sharing these results, but I'm just sort of uh, looking um, through my end. Um, thank you. Um, so wasn't aware of the opportunity that, um, you know, is is um, is something that we're trying to um, help support groups with learning about these different opportunities. And, um, you know, a lot of them can be sort of hidden in, in websites or, um, you know, put out through email blasts that can be, um, that can get lost in, you know, your email list. And so um, we are trying to call attention to these different opportunities because they are so important and they are, um, you know, some something that um, is, is is available for everyone to to get involved in. And um, so if you want to go to the, the next um, slide. And so the coalition and River Network um, wanted to um, help to bring awareness to these different opportunities. And so we decided to put together a public input opportunities web page. It's hosted on the coalition's website. And there's the link right there. Um, and so I'm just going to go through it really quickly. Um, and so this is what it looks like when, once you log in. Um, and I wanted to highlight three, um, three important pieces here. So number one um, is the announcement for public comments. So the circle on the right, the open public comment periods section, that is where you will find um, any open public comment periods. Um, so be sure to look there, come back, you know, every once in a while to check and see if, if there are updates, if there are anything, um, if there are any new um, opportunities. And those are links, so you can click directly into those links and go to the opportunities. Um, secondly, at the bottom, we have sections, um, general public comment opportunities, water quality standards and reporting, and permitting. And so you click on those and their drop downs, and I'll show you in, um, in uh, one of the next slides what they really look like. Um, but those are there to provide additional information and additional links for you all to get a better idea of what the opportunities are and then to um, send you on your way to your state, um, your state websites to get more information about what your state is specifically doing. Um, and then lastly, the contact information. This is, um, I wanted to highlight this because these are, you know, links to each state's um, you know, list serves or um, list of people to contact um, if you want to chat or, or, you know, communicate with them on these um, different opportunities. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is uh, what you will, so this is sort of a, um, a zoom in of the open public comment periods section and you'll notice there is a submit open comment period button. And so that goes to a Google form. And so this is, you know, to, um, for you to help us and for you to help get the word out about different opportunities. If you notice, if you come to the site and you notice that there are opportunities missing that you would love to highlight and you would love people to know about, um, click on that button and then fill out this Google form. And then that will go, um, that'll go to us and we will put it up on the website. Um, and you, and then there's also, um, some, uh, a section to just add in, um, you know, some more information about uh, what the what the opportunity is and um, and then a link to the opportunity as well. So we encourage you to uh, if you if you have opportunities that aren't included in here um, on the website to fill out this Google form. Next slide, please. And this is just a snapshot of what you would see if you clicked on the different sections. So if you clicked on the permitting section, you'll get a drop down list and here um, you'll see the NIPTES section. We talk about what um, the permits are and then how to get involved and the timelines, things like that. And then below it, you'll see that there are links to each state 
within the Delaware. And then we also have the DRBC and the EPA headquarters. And so these links will take you to um, additional information based on the state. And I do want to note that each state is a little different in how they roll things out, obviously how they um, format their web pages. So, you know, each link is not going to be exactly the same, but it will be a way for you to sort of cut down on going through a rabbit hole of trying to find the right information. And this, um, you know, should be a somewhat direct uh, link to what you might be looking for within the different categories. Next slide, please. And so we really encourage you to take a look at the web page and do you know do some searching click on the different links and um, also encourage you to reach out for questions if you see an opportunity um, or you just want to learn a little bit more about the different opportunities feel free to reach out and you know i'm happy to walk through the different reports with you they can be very large and somewhat confusing and each state is different so um so it's a process you know of learning how um, how to review the reports and, and walk through them and then also, you know, what to look for when commenting. So feel free to reach out. Um, I love to talk about it um, if you have any questions. Um, and then, so here are just some general commenting tips. They are open to everyone and, you know, you don't need to be an expert or a scientist to get involved. Your local knowledge, the data that you have, your observations, they are incredibly valuable and, you know, you know your watershed likely more than anyone um, and likely more than the state. And the state has you know, a lot of watersheds to dig into. So um, if you have information, you know, don't be intimidated by the length of the report, don't be intimidated by the jargon and, and all of that. Um, and if you see an issue, if you see an omission, or if you just wanna offer support, submit the comments. Um, and again, reach out if, um, if you want a little extra, extra help in, in reviewing the report or submitting the comments. Um, it's important to focus on science rather than opinions. So you wanna make sure that you can back up your statements with, with facts and science. Um, and show support if you can. You know, comments don't just have to be about pointing out issues. If you're really supportive of something that you read, let them know. And one way to amplify your voice is to collaborate with others in your area. You know, watershed organizations, volunteer groups, local chapters, get them together, talk about your watershed priorities, how your data compares to the report, and encourage them to submit their own comments. Um, and then lastly, check out the public engagement webpage. Uh, and then I think one more slide. So these are just the resources. This is the webpage. Um, and then here are some just effective or tips for effective commenting from the EPA. I think they have um, some pretty good tips in there. Check it out if you are getting ready to comment. Um, and again, thank you very much. Um, uh, and I welcome your questions. I think we're gonna do questions at the end, so I welcome them. Um, and uh, with that, I will pass it over to Diana. Thank you so much, Colleen. Hi everyone, I'm Diana Martin. I am the Director of Communications and Marketing at an organization called Rodale Institute. And I'm gonna give the thumbs up for the slide change so you'll see that today. Um, if you're not familiar with Rodale Institute, we're actually relatively new to the coalition. We are a nonprofit organization that is headquartered in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. And we've been around for 70 years focused on organic and regenerative agriculture. So working on research, farmer training, and consumer education all around good farming practices. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about a project that we're working on with our partners at the Stroudwater Research Center. It's being funded by the William Penn Foundation. And the goal of our project is to reduce pollution from agriculture in the Delaware River watershed. So this is a six year project. We're in year three right now. And this is a really important project because agriculture is actually one of the biggest land uses in the watershed. There's about 15,000 farms in the watershed. Next slide, please. Yep. And um, ag runoff. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, back to the ag runoff. Yep. Um, and ag runoff is, if you're not familiar with the idea of agriculture runoff, um, it's a serious issue because um, what happens is typically during a heavy rainfall event, um, 
the water from the rain can wash um, soil from our farm fields into our watersheds. And it's not taking with it just soil, which is you know, bad for our soils to be de become degraded. It takes with it anything that we put on the farm field. So fertilizers, chemicals, pesticides, which threatens both our drinking water. Um, and we know there's about 13 million people who rely on their drinking water from the Delaware River watershed. But it also threatens wildlife by creating dead zones. And you can see one here in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the, the fertilizers typically from the farm fields um, create algae blooms that suck oxygen out of the water and create these dead zones. This, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is actually about the size of the state of New Hampshire and is caused um, primarily from farms in the Midwest, the runoff running down the Mississippi River. And often this is an issue we talk about um, in, in regards to the Chesapeake Bay for a little bit more of a local example. So we're hoping to tackle this issue in the Delaware River watershed through research, farmer training, and consumer education. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk a lot about the consumer campaign today, but I just wanted to mention the other elements of the project. We're working on a really exciting research project with the Stroud Water uh, Research Center that's at the Stroud Preserve in Chester County. And this project is really the first of its kind anywhere around the world. It's at a massive scale for a research project. We're actually doing this on 40 acres of sloped land on the Stroud Preserve. There's a stream running through and we're able to compare conventional farming practices, which are the farming practices we typically see, um, industrial chemical farming um, versus conservation farming and then organic farming. And we're able to track what is the difference in the ag runoff based on what we do on the farm fields. Um, and we're also able to track other information like yields, profitability, um, and even what's happening to the aquifers underneath the farmland. So this is really important. The um, Stroud Center has been doing research actually on the same land for decades. So we have a lot of baseline data. And one thing that they had found in their previous research um, was that riparian buffers can prevent about 25% of the runoff from the farm fields um, from reaching the, the watershed. Um, but only about 25% of that I runoff is prevented by the riparian buffers. So we know that we need to look at what we're actually doing in the farm fields to really make a difference to this pollution. Next slide, please. And here's what we found so far. Um, two pieces of science that I think are interesting to this group. One, um, it's really, it's all about healthy soil. So the soil is there's more living things in a teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on the planet. And what we found is healthy soil, which is um, that you need to use good farming practices like cover cropping and crop rotation, reducing your tillage, things like no chemicals. Um, we've, we found kind of two big takeaways with water. One, the healthier soils can actually absorb more water. We say that they have a higher infiltration rate. So you can see in the, the one image of the organic field versus the conventional field that in the, um, these are side by side, right? Um, same crops, the same fields, just side by side. Um, in the fields with the healthier soil, it can absorb the water where you can see that pooling in the conventional um, fields that's starting to flood from a heavy rainfall event. And the other thing we found is that healthy soils that you can see in the other image um, actually have better, the science term is aggregate stability, which basically means it holds together. Um, so the, the bacteria and fungi, all the things in healthy soil actually form a glue so that um, when we do have heavy rainfall events, it stays together instead of just the degraded soils break away and wash away and create that agriculture pollution. Next slide. So we're doing this research, but we really need to connect the dots. Um, if the research, it, we can't have the impact without farmers as, as part of our, our project and our team. So we're working a lot helping farmers implement these practices and transition to organic. 
we've actually started a new consulting program. So any farmers who want to start implementing um, practices that contribute to healthy soil, we work with them on their farms, at their kitchen tables, in their fields. And it, that service is actually free to any farmer in the state of Pennsylvania through um, funding from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Next slide, please. And uh, the last element is a consumer education campaign. At the end of the day, farming is a business and farmers are producing what we're demanding as consumers. And historically, what we've been de demanding is the cheapest food possible, which has been at the expense of our environment. So we know that we need to get consumers part of this conversation, um, get them to value farming in a way that protects our resources like water um, and ultimately um, create demand to, to shift the farmer's practices and reward them for um, doing these things that are often more labor intensive. So we developed a consumer education campaign to help people understand more about the connection between the food they put on their plate, farming and clean water. And we're calling that campaign Grow Clean Water. Thanks, Rita. So we sort of, before we started this consumer campaign, we surveyed the landscape to see what do people already know about this issue? What are their thoughts? And um, two pieces I found in really interesting I wanted to share with you all is we found number one that Americans care deeply about their state of their water. It consistently ranks um, tops Americans environmental concerns. And one of the reasons that it's been really brought to light is actually through the tragedy of um, in Flint, Michigan, um, involving polluted drinking water. That was one of the reasons that really has become top of mind for Americans to worry about drinking water. Um, but we're seeing a disconnect when it comes to agriculture and farming. A lot of people um, the average American adult actually think that farming is good for the environment. And I think the reason for that is people think of farms as beautiful, bucolic, open spaces, and that must be good for the environment to have all this land that, you know, hasn't been developed. Um, and it's often there's a disconnect about the way that we produce food today through industrial agriculture and the effect that it's having on things like our air, soil, water, and climate. Next slide, please. So as we decided to dive into this consumer education campaign, we were deciding uh, what audience we would focus on. And we decided to focus on young families, um, especially in the Philadelphia area. And one reason for that is actually the number one purchaser of organic food right now is millennials. And interesting enough, um, the thing that gets people to buy organic for the first time um, is when they're pregnant with their first child. So we know when people are starting a family, they're thinking more about their health um, and they're more likely to change their purchasing decisions. We also find these young families really care about the environment, are more will willing to pay more for things that align with their values. Um, and the added benefit of engaging this audience is we can in involve kids and that's the next generation. We really want to help them understand more about decisions they make every day, like what they put on their plate and how that impacts the world around them. Next slide, please. So we just started the consumer campaign right at the end of last year. We launched a website called growcleanwater.org. I would encourage you to check it out. Um, you can see a few screen grabs from the website here. And in the website, we start um, making that connection for people between our clean water and what and healthy farms and what does that mean um, and one thing that's a challenge for consumers is there's not often a lot of transparency about how your food is grown and people are more and more disconnected from farming a lot of people think you know their food comes from the grocery store and a lot of people live in urban areas now and have never even stepped foot on a farm so it's hard to often know if your, far, if your farmer was using cover crops or reducing tillage. But one thing that consumers can look for is the organic label. That's something that provides some transparency behind the food that you buy. And you know that if something's organic, it's grown without GMOs, 
without uh, pesticides, herbicides, and organic farmers are encouraged to use practices like um, cover cropping. So those are, this is one of the things that we let people know that they can look out for. Um, we do provide information as well for people who have the privilege to actually talk to a farmer what you should ask and think about to know if you go to a farmer's market to know more about how your food is produced. Next slide, please. And um, at the, on the website, I, I think in the interest of time, I won't play one of the videos now, but just wanted to let you know we've produced some videos, um, some animated videos that are really kid friendly to start talking about the idea of farms and, and how they impact the world around you, including clean water. And we've also produced some farmer videos of real farmers in our watershed talking about what they do to, to protect clean water. So I encourage you to check those out. Next slide, please. So one of the ways we've been spreading the word about our campaign this year, um, because of coronavirus, we've been limited in being able to do programming and events, which is something we hope to do in the future. So we've mostly been spreading the word about the campaign digitally through social media ads with our videos, pushing people to the website and um, encouraging people to take action. So we encourage people to um, pledge to grow clean water on, on the website. And any family that makes that pledge actually get, got a free pledge kit in the mail because we wanted to still give people an experience even if we weren't able to congregate this year because of coronavirus. So in, if you signed up for the pledge, you got a pledge kit in the mail that um, taught you more about the connection between farming and water, um, encouraged you to actually grow an organic plant to see more about soil and how you grow food. There's healthy recipes so you can make that connection between the food that's grown and what you put on your plate. Um, there were activities for families, um, like a way for them to find local farmers markets. You could actually send a postcard to an organic farmer in your community to thank them for what they do to grow clean water. So the pledge kits have been um, a really exciting part of the project. We built a thousand pledge kits and I was pretty shocked that they sold out in two months after we launched them this spring. All a thousand um, pledge kits were grabbed and I think part of it was actually the timing because of coronavirus. There were a lot of families at home with kids. Um, even this spring, we saw that organic sales were up 30% this spring um, as people were more focused on health. Gardening really skyrocketed this spring. Families were joining CSAs. So I think there was an appetite of wanting to get, um, find ways to get kids involved at home um, that involved health. So there was a lot of interest in this campaign. Next slide, please. And we did follow up with the families who got the pledge kits and we asked them a number of questions. One of the questions that's been really exciting is we asked people um, after this experience, after we learned with your family, would you be able to buy organic in the future? Um, and with 10 being an absolute yes, um, the average answer was nine of people who got the pledge kits. So that's been a really exciting result. Next slide, please. Um, so we just were, are, we're in the early stages of, of launching our Grow Clean Water campaign. I just wanted to let you know about a few things that we're still working on and um, kind of what to expect. Um, some of the other projects we're working on, you can see the um, gentleman there with the virtual reality headset. We're actually creating right now a virtual reality experience of um, organic and regenerative farm. One of the things we found is that often people who live, live in urban centers, they've never been to a farm. They don't know what a healthy farm looks like. So we want to be able to bring that experience to people through virtual reality. We'll have these headsets that um, we can bring to events in the future. We'll be able to share with people online so that we can kind of bring the experience of stepping on a farm um, wherever you are. We are working on a, a children's book right now, all about healthy farms that we'll be offering on our website in the future to replace those pledge kits that are sold out. We've been working with artists um, called Amber Art and Design from Philadelphia on a new mural that you can see here that we're actually installing 
at the Rodale Institute headquarters um, this month. And we get about 20,000 visitors to Rodale every year and we wanted to use this as an opportunity to start connecting the dots for people between farming and water. So that's been a really fun experience. And we are in the process um, this fall of launching a new pop-up at the viaduct in Philadelphia, which is under the rail park, where people can go and actually kind of walk this space and learn more about farming and what it has to do with clean water. So if you see that little image in the corner, it's actually on a, that's a sign that's on a chicken coop at the viaduct where people can start learning more things about farming um, in an urban area. Um, and I just wanted to let you all know that um, we still have three years of this project left. So there's a lot of opportunity in the future for collaboration. We plan to do more programming and events and really bring the idea to families about how healthy farms connect to clean water and what people can do to get involved. Um, so if anyone else has ideas or ways your organization would like to get involved, I just also want to open that invitation and just thank you for the chance today to introduce the idea of the campaign. And in the, there's so many things we can talk about, but in the interest of time, I am going to hand it off to Eric. And if you have any questions, I'd love to talk more in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Diana, I appreciate that. I'm actually also here to talk about uh, pledges as a tool for uh, civic engagement and getting people involved. So I'm Eric Eckel. Water Words That Work is my company, and our mission is to ensure that the American people enjoy clean and safe water outdoors and at home. And we do this by helping clients and our students succeed with outreach and communication. And I'm going to talk about one of our um, projects, one of my favorite of the various projects that we have worked on, and it is a pledge drive. And I'll show you how this one works. And then uh, maybe in the chats or in the question, we can uh, brainstorm some ways that you might be able to take this basic approach and apply it to uh, some situation back where you're working. Our project is also from the Delaware River Basin. So if you'll go on to the next slide, uh, Rita. Now we are a private firm. And so all of the work that we do is on behalf of our clients. And our client for this project is the Newcastle County Department of Public Works. And you can see Newcastle County there. It's um, uh, the top county of uh, Delaware, uh, geographically speaking, that is the northernmost county is what I should say. Um, and it is mostly in the Delaware River Basin, although some of it drains to the Chesapeake. So we kind of take credit for this project for both um, major river basins. Now, um, the Newcastle De County Department of Public Works is the agency or the arm of the county government that has the MS4 permit. And so a lot of the work that we do for them is about meeting the education and outreach requirements of their permit. And one of the problems they have is sanitary sewer overflows. And so in one of our early engagements with them uh, back in the last decade, we came up with the idea of doing a pledge drive. And if you go on to the next slide, Rita. Um, pledges have a lot of uses. Now, uh, Diana was talking about using a pledge to get people to um, commit to purchasing organic foods going forward. And that's a very good um, uh, candidate for a pledge because when we do a pledge, we're trying to uh, use a, a good candidate for a pledge is something that's concrete, it's simple, and it would otherwise be kind of difficult to measure. Um, in order to know which, how many consumers are actually buying organic food, you would have to get like the complete uh, sales from all of the major grocery store chains and the estimates of how many people are shopping at farmers markets and on and on and on. That would really be almost impossible data to collect. So a pledge of people who promise they're going to purchase organic food is a good proxy for that. Um, in this case, the uh, pledge is to can the grease. So after they've brought home all that organic produce that they promised Diane they were going to buy, they cook it at home. We are concerned about what happens to the cooking oil, fat, and grease after that. Um, pledges are good for things like canning the grease, scooping poop, buying certain products, avoiding certain products, you know, things that are really simple and don't require tons of explanation and that you couldn't otherwise get a better handle on how many people are actually going to do that. So let's go on to the next slide, Rita. 
Pledges are um, uh, not a good choice if the thing that you want that audience and the public to do, if, they're, if it's really difficult and they're going to need some kind of a technical assistance to do it or some kind of a financial assistance to do it, um, then a pledge isn't really a good choice because you can get a better measure of how many people are putting in rain barrels because you'll know how many you helped install. Or you'll get a better measure of how many farmers switched a certain field uh, from conventional to organic farming because you will help them do it, and so you'll have an exact count. And so then if you can get an exact count, why would you go with the pledge? Go for the better data. The pledge is when you can't really get a better measure of that. Um, pledges are also not great for things that are not very well defined. If you want to raise awareness of something or uh, have people learn more about something, the pledge just doesn't really quite fit that niche. Um, let's go on to the next slide. So in Newcastle County, the problem is sanitary sewer overflows, or I should say, according to the permit, the problem is the sanitary sewer overflow. So people like ourselves in the uh, business of protecting uh, waterways, the problem as we see it is the image that you see here on the left. It's the overflowing sewer system spraying nasty stuff into the nearest creek, into the nearest river, and then down to um, the mouth of the Delaware, the Atlantic Ocean, et cetera, et cetera. However, for residents of Newcastle County, they are more likely to be exposed to the problem of sewer overflows with basement backups. So that's an advantage for us is that, yes, people care about clean water, but when they see something like this overflowing sewer system, they say, oh, somebody ought to do something about that. And then when they have their basement backed up and full of sewage, they say, I have to do something about that. And then the pledge drive comes in. You are doing something for yourself and you are also doing something for the environment. And people will uh, do it for themselves and then they will rationalize that they are doing it for the environment. So that's the challenge here is, or the opportunity, however you wanna see it, is that we want to solve a pollution problem while at the same time helping people um, avoid a really unpleasant situation at home. Next slide. And here's the cause. The cause of these problems has two uh, there's two sides to it, too. What our consumers experience is on the left. It's the, 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 the sinks that won't drain, the toilets that won't flush because they have uh, cooked up a bunch of uh, bacon or who knows what, and they poured the grease down the sink, ended up clogging their own plumbing, and now they have the problem at home. Uh, but the environmental problem comes into play when some of that grease, some of that fat, some of that oil ends up in the sewer system, clogs up the sewer system, and that's what leads to the kinds of problems that um, I showed you on the previous side. And the solution is really very simple. Once you've finished your cooking, don't put the grease in the sink, put it in the trash, pour it in a can, keep the can in the freezer until it's full, toss it in the trash afterwards. It's a basic household hygiene issue that benefits both the homeowner directly and the environment indirectly. And so in comes the pledge, which you'll see on our next slide. And so the name of our campaign is called Great Schools Clean Streams, and it's greatschoolscleanstreams.org, and that's the website. And basically we've got it set up as uh, it's a pledge drive. The ultimate metric that we are looking for is how many residents of Newcastle County are going to fill out a form and sign a pledge saying, from now on, I'm going to dispose of my fats, oil, and grease properly. So now the campaign is designed to get as many people as possible to do that. And so the Newcastle County Department of Public Works, with our help behind the scenes, you really won't see our name on this website at all or anywhere on the campaign. We're, you know, behind the scenes helping the county with this, is to take this idea of a pledge drive and make it a competition. So now if you go on to the next slide, our partners in the competition are the schools. 
So the website explains the contest, it explains the rules, it has some information about why this is a problem, why it's bad for you at your home if this happens, why it's bad for the waterways if this happens. And on every single page of that website is a big button that says, take the pledge, and here's the pledge. And we collect their email address, their name, and a couple of basic things. Um, and then there's two things that we ask them that are really important for our campaigns. So let's go on to the next slide, Rita. And the first thing that we ask them is to which school do you assign your pledge? So if someone um, decides they're going to participate and takes the pledge, they can click on that little pull down menu and a complete list of all the schools will come up and they can choose one and credit their pledge to that school. And I will say we didn't expect when we first started this project for them that coming up with an actual valid master list of the schools would be as hard as it was, but it, that was actually one of the hardest parts of this. Um, and then the second question that's super important is we ask, how did you hear about the campaign? And that is another really important metric. They have to uh, click the checkbox that says, I pledge I'm going to dispose of my cooking fats, oils, and grease properly. And they have to check the box that says, I am 18 years or older. Because when you start collecting personal information from minors over the internet, you're asking for a lot of trouble or you're, you're going to jump through a lot of hoops to make sure that that data is protected to a super uh, high level, which we didn't want to do. So we have just limited the online pledging to adults 18 or over for lots of reasons. Let's go on to the next slide. And so now the, comp the thing is set up as a competition. And this is uh, the results from 2019. And so the schools win cash prizes. That is very much the key to why the final results, which I'll be showing you in a few minutes, are as um, substantial as they are. So every spring, we run the campaign. Obviously, we didn't do it this spring because right as we were about to launch the 2020 campaign, all the schools went virtual and sent everybody home. Now, this campaign could work in a totally virtual environment, but there just wasn't enough time. The timing was off. Everybody got sent home. All the schools were scrambling. They were all trying to figure it out. We couldn't imagine them going through this exercise again right at that moment. But if school is still virtual in 2021 in spring, we're going to roll on out because there's no physical participation that's required. So now the campaign runs for three weeks, and during the three weeks, the schools are competing for cash prizes to promote the contest on their Facebook pages, promote it through their email newsletters, send home the backpack flyers with the students, uh, put out the message to all the faculty, put out the message to the alumni and the PTAs, and all of the parents who are at that school all of the alumni of that school, all the staff at that school have a reason to help us promote the pledge drive because they're competing for cash prizes. And you can start to see that some of the numbers on this screen are actually kind of impressive. So Olive B. Loss Elementary School, they've got um, more than a thousand pledges that they have collected from their parents and their alumni and their staff. Um, the second place on this slide is the Cab Calloway School for the Arts, almost a thousand and the odyssey charter school is coming in in third place at this time with 919 pledges and the um we have learned over the years that the best way to do this is to be like with like so the it, we started out with the high schools against the high schools and the middle schools against the middle schools and the elementary schools against the elementary schools and then we had the private schools against the public schools but after a few years, we realized that we were really making it very hard for the smaller schools to compete with the big schools. So uh, in recent years, we've switched it up, and now it's based on size. So these are the big schools here, and the big schools compete with the big schools, regardless of if they're public or private or high school or elementary school. The mid-sized schools compete with the mid-sized schools, and the small schools compete with the small schools. And when we made that change, we saw participation continue to grow because some of the schools that had in previous years had said, well, we just don't have a prayer, so we're just not going to bother. Now they're like, well, we're only competing with, you know, we're picking on people our own size, so we'll play and we'll compete. 
Now, if you go on to the next slide, I'll show you how the results have unfolded over the years. So it started as a pilot program back in 2013. This is the first time we had ever attempted it. And we got 762 pledges, which was pretty good for the first year. Uh, we didn't run it again in 2014 because we had to go through a procurement process to have this be more than a pilot and have it be the real thing. And then you see that basically the trend is up year after year after year. 2020, of course, we weren't able to run it, so that will be another zero uh, when I'm doing this presentation three years from now. But we saw that we have grown from 762 to 20, a little less than 2,500 on up into the 16,000s every year. And so now how, what contributes to the steady growth over time? Well, there's a couple of things. And the first is, like I mentioned, we have adjusted over time, over years, the way we set up the prize structure and how we decide which schools are competing with which schools, all towards making it seem feasible for a participating school that they might win. We want it to be to seem fair for all the schools that if they jump in and they make a fair effort, there is a, they're going to have a fair chance at, at winning a cash prize, which they can use. The prizes are not huge. It's about $10,000 in cash prizes spread across like 20 schools. So, you know, they're working pretty hard for not tons of money, but, um, but they seem to really enjoy it, actually, because they're doing something good for their um, it's educational for the students and the parents and and, um, you know, they seem to like doing it. Now, we've tried variations on this approach with different things. We've tried doing it with neighborhood associations competing instead of schools. We've tried it with churches competing instead of schools. We've tried it with um, uh, homeless uh, service organizations competing instead of schools. And the schools really do really well, and none of the other partners that we have attempted have done very well at all. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that, we assume. And one is that schools are used to competing with each other. They have football teams and basketball teams and marching bands and who knows what that compete with each other. So the culture of a school is to try and compete with the other schools. And that matters a lot for this purpose. Whereas churches are not really used to competing with each other. Homeless shelters are not used to competing with each other. Neighborhood associations are not really used to competing with each other. And when presented with an opportunity that is a competition, they just kind of like, uh, okay. The second thing that's really important is that schools have really good jungle drums. Parents pay attention to the messages that come out of their kids' school. Um, the, the degree to which they are going to actually follow the messages that are coming home with the backpack or coming out in the email or appearing on the social media from the school is really high. So um, this has been a very successful campaign for that reason. Um, now, the third reason that this campaign has been steady and grown over time, and Reed, if you can click back a couple of slides so that they see that form again. Here, uh, one more. We collect the email address. When they take the pledge form, they collect the email address. So every year, we start each year's campaign with all of the email addresses that we collected in all the previous years. So we started our first campaign with zero email addresses and we got to 762. So we started our second year campaign with 762 email addresses and that took us to a little, uh, if you keep going. Rita, let's go back forward to the one that shows the numbers going up. One more. There you go. So you can see, oh, back one. So we started with zero and we ended up with 762 email addresses. In 2015, we started with 762 email addresses and ended up with 2,400 email addresses. In 2016, we started with 2,400 email addresses and ended up with 9,500 email addresses and so on and so forth. So now we have a master list of almost 40,000 email addresses that we have collected. Obviously, some of them are duplicates. People can pledge every year. We hope they do constant reminders are part of the plan here. Um, 
but each year we just start with a big leg up over the previous year with all these email addresses that we can blast to. And I would encourage all of you as you are contemplating your outreach effort, look for an opportunity to put it on an annual cycle or a quarterly cycle and really focus on collecting those email addresses so that you can start to get the snowball effect that you are seeing here. Now, another thing that's important for the success of the campaign is when they take the pledge, we ask them, how did you hear about it? And what we have seen by asking this question year over year over year is that the messages that the number one thing that gets us pledges is emails to last year's pledges. Those emails are crucial. And the number two is the schools pushing out the messages for them. Because we ask how they heard about the campaign, we have spent less and less and less money over the years on advertising of every kind. Facebook advertising just doesn't work as well. We just don't get the bang for the buck as we get from getting the school. So we have slowly shifted our money from advertising over to prizes because if the prizes incentivize the schools to really work the campaign hard, that gets us more pledges than directly advertising to the parents. Those are the kinds of things that we learn because we ask, how did you hear about the campaign when they take the pledge? So let's go on to the next slide, and I'm going to stop yakking, and I'm going to put the uh, thing out there for you. What's a river-friendly behavior that you could consider running a pledge drive for? You've heard about, too, buying organic produce from a local farmer is good for your local river, and pledging to dispose of the fats, oils, and grease properly after you cook that organic food is another good thing you can do for your river. Let me see in the chat what else you might uh, contemplate, and then I'll discuss what it would, you know, if you throw out your ideas, I'll tell you what I might uh, think about it based on the experience that we've had. Well, Tally asked me a question, so I'll answer Tally's question while you are um, coming up with your suggestions. So she said, is the county seeing less griefs in the pipes through the years? The county is definitely seeing fewer overflows as the years go by. But I, they wouldn't say that the pledge drive is responsible for all of that because they're doing two things at once. And one is that they are running, well, they're doing three things. They're doing the pledge drive for the general public. They're doing um, inspections for the big restaurants. And then they've got some kind of um, uh, grease-eating bacteria that they are shooting into the sewer systems. I don't really understand it. It sounds like something could go terribly wrong, but they seem to feel that they're doing a better job breaking down the fat bergs with the uh, treatment that they have. So now a couple of um, things, and then I'll turn it over to the Q&A. Um, a pledge to reduce single-use plastics would be a great one. It's very clear what that is. And you wouldn't have any other way of measuring if they ever did it. So that's a great pledge from Tish. Um, at least one native perennial in your garden from Tali. There's two words in there that you might need to think about before you ran out with that. And one is native, and the other is perennial, because that mean, can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different kinds of people. And I think you might have more success if you were much more specific, like plant this, that, or the other thing and identify them by name rather than categorizing them as native or perennial. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rita and we're going to go to the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric, Colleen, and Diane. Diana, we uh, really appreciate all of the information that you presented um, for us today. We do have several questions. Um, I know that we're already at time, but if folks do have the ability to stay on, um, I think that you will get a lot out of some of these responses, so please stick around. Um, so we do have a question from Tali. Uh, and I believe this question is for Diana. So um, when you are trying to get people, um, okay, so when you're trying to get uh, convince people to pay more for food um, that is organic, how do you address equity issues? So people um, who can't afford to pay for more, more food. And then we also do have a, a similar question of how are you discussing grow clean water in marginalized communities? Yes, thank you. And I think 
Tally, it looks like you got one of our pledge kits. So thank you for signing the pledge and getting one at home. I'm glad you could participate. Um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely, this is an issue that comes up all the time with organic. Um, how do we move something like organic food to being for everyone, not just for someone who's wealthy or privileged or shops at a farmer's market? Um, and that was actually one of the reasons I wanted to mention the research project that we're doing. Um, ultimately, when we look long term, we really need to change policy around food. Um, right now, we subsidize most of our farming in the United States to the point that um, for every dollar that a farmer earns, over 50 cents of that comes from the US government. Um, and unfortunately, we're subsidizing the, the wrong kind of agriculture right now. We're sort of encouraging people to monocrop corn and soybeans um, that end up turning into processed foods that are making people unhealthy. So one of the reasons we wanna do the research project is because we found that really the only way we can change policy is by having really good research data to say this is exactly how farming is impacting these issues and this is how we wanna see a change. So ultimately we wanna change the policy around what we're subsidizing, subsidize farmers to grow fresh, healthy, local food that's good for the environment um, so we can make it more affordable for more people. Um, and ultimately one of our um, other goals would be there's a lot of federal food programs and why are those food programs uh, who are often are you know sometimes our most marginalized and vulnerable communities why are they not getting organic food why couldn't we make all, all the meal programs in schools that you have to buy from local organic farms um, all the other institutions so I think that would be one way to get organic um, into more communities. And we do tell people who, um, you know, there are ways to eat organic affordably. We tell people to grow your own if you can, and that's been part of the campaign, um, to join something like a CSA that can really drive down costs, to buy the ugly produce at the grocery stores. That's a new emerging trend. Um, and ultimately for us, as we move forward with this campaign, um, to work with um, more communities of color and lower income communities is, is a really important part of the campaign. And I think the best way for us to do that is to partner with other organizations who are already working with um, within these communities, especially as we wanna go into something like, as we wanna work more in Philadelphia, how do we bridge that sort of urban rural divide? How do we go into an urban area and help people understand about farming, which is maybe something that a lot of kids haven't grown up with. Um, and I think the, the key for us is to partner with organizations who are already in those communities and doing that work and seeing how we can be of assistance and bring our knowledge and resource and bring worm bins and soil for kids and, and um, you know, healthy food and snacks and kind of bring what we have to offer as an organization with the organizations who are already working there. So that's gonna be a big part of our strategy in the next couple of years of the campaign. And I definitely, um, again, just welcome um, anyone who is working with communities that really are interested in this message of healthy food and how it relates to clean water to let me know if there's ways that we can partner with you. Excellent, thank you, Diana. Um, so our next question is for um, Diana and Eric. And the question is, um, what's, what's the follow up like after people take a pledge? Is there any way to track that folks are actually following through? Well, we do a follow up survey. So once the pledge drive closes, we have to go through and tally up the results and figure out who the winners are. And then we send everybody who takes the pledge uh, email that says, um, we want you to fill out our post campaign survey. And if you fill out our post campaign survey, we'll tell you who won. So um, what we see in the post campaign surveys is that upwards of 90% of the um, people who took the pledge are saying that they will now 
uh, go forward and, and properly dispose of their fats, oils, and grease. Now, we know that surveys are full of self-reporting bias, and so not everybody that says they're going to do it is actually going to do it. But that's why we're doing a pledge drive for this particular behavior, because there's no other way to know. That's the best kind of data that would be reasonably available. We can't send an army of inspectors to look over everybody's shoulder while they're cooking to see what they do. So the pledges and the follow-up survey are the next best thing. So that, that's how we do it, is that there's a follow-up survey. And in order to take the survey, or in order to see who won the contest, they have to take the survey. Yeah, I would say that one of the nice the incentives for us to do the pledge was just like Eric mentioned, it, it's a way for us to capture people's information. So we were able to get their emails, their addresses, because we actually mailed them something. Um, and that's been a great way for us to stay in touch with the, these, you know, a thousand families that signed this pledge are kind of a great focus group for us. As we roll out the pledge, we've been able to follow up with them at the survey, but we plan to keep in touch with this group. Um, like as we start doing events and programming that we can invite them to things in the future. So I, I don't see it as something that we just wanted people to do this pledge, but we are building community with them. And like, for example, we've been um, sending that group um, articles and videos that we've been creating around clean water. So just keeping them engaged over the next couple of years will be one of our goals. And, um, you know, hearing from them, we've had people who took the pledge who suggested really great next steps of how we can keep the project going. So I think that's, that's one way is to ask them their thoughts and ideas and feedback and then just keep them on the journey by engaging them with the work that you're doing. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't see any other questions in the chat box. So I'm just going to conclude by saying thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you, Colleen, Eric, and Diana. I really appreciate your time today. Um, and thank you for everybody who tuned in. Please take our survey. We'd love to hear your feedback on this session and on the forum. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at your next session. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye.